Welcome back to AI War 2, continuing to look at the additions for the Zenith Onslaught expansion. For this video, we're going to be taking a look at the big items that have been added, mostly for the player, but some for the AI as well. So, this is one of the golems. There are three additional golems. This is the Raijin, Raijin, not sure exactly the right pronunciation. I have icons off here so that we can see the models in detail. And... This is, you know, it has the chain lightning weapon is the main thing here. You can see it's not hugely powerful in terms of its hull strength. This is actually a slightly marked up version of it, but it does have a very nice, powerful weapon. We're going to see that chain lightning on display in a minute. But if we look at the front of the model here, it looks kind of hungry. And from a size point of view, this is, like, for example, this is an Arc-1, and we've got a transport flagship here. These are some Dark Zenith ships. More familiar objects. We've got an armored golem over here. This is a botnet. I think there's, yeah, that's a lost spire. Figure it out that way. So we can see it's got a pretty good size to it. It's not a small little piece of clay floating around in space. So let's take a look at what that weapon does. It's going to back off. And those right there are the chain lightning. You can see some other ships that have them as well. It's firing over this way. And the beams will jump from one target to another. And again, you can see this thing can do, depending on the situation, it needs lots of targets to really do its full amount. But it can do a few hundred thousand DPS. So that is very cool indeed. On this map, we can see the other two golems that are available. We have the Retribution golem here. And this one, the big key here is look at the electrotoxic percent, 60%. So over half of the incoming damage gets reflected back. It's also very durable. So the idea is this will go into a throng of enemies, absorb a bunch of damage, and just sort of throw the majority of it back at them. It will basically use their own firepower against them. Now, you can't repair it, but you can use it in spurts. Because you see the regeneration there, it will regenerate itself if it's not being attacked over a three minute period. So you wanna throw it into the fight, once it gets low, pull it out, let it repair itself, send it back in, that kind of thing. So definitely a unique type of golem that not previously present in the game, as is our final customer, which is the Frenzy Golem. And this thing doesn't do a lot of damage until it gets hit. But you can see the bonus there, every 20% its hull goes down, it will increase its damage significantly. The worse shape this is in, the more dangerous it becomes. But of course, you don't want to let it get crippled. So it, this is, you got to be sort of a brinksmanship approach when deploying this into battle and really be smart on when you're going to pull it out and try to have it repair. But if it's not actually in combat and taking damage, it's actually going to do worse. And now on to cruisers. Now, they're putting in a way to get a couple of different types of cruisers by hacking Dark Zenith and Architrave. But as of right now, there are 15 different cruisers available, and most of them you're going to get from these. The cruiser construction facilities. And there aren't a lot of these around, so you're not going to be able to have access to all the choices in one, in one particular map. You have to play a number of games to be able to see them all. But they come in a variety of types, and... With these cruise construction facilities, you get two choices. These are both riot control varieties. So if we take a look at these, uh, one is a shotgun and one is a taser. But these are, again, roughly arc level capacity. I did mention in the first episode that they're also destroyers. I misspoke. Destroyers are not a thing. So just cruisers. But again, there's still a variety of choice here. You do pay AI progress for getting them. And you can see the energy cost is pretty substantial. On the other hand, they have significant capabilities. Now you can see this one has a laser, and then it has this shotgun, which can hit 40 targets at once at a fairly short range, but still pretty nice. Also has grenades for area effect. So you can see here that the riot control type specializes in disabling and destroying large numbers of weaker disturbances to the piece. You've played classic, that's very familiar to you as these are sort of a different implementation of the riot control starships that were available then. And this is a different one here now. We have the Taser, 
This one has a whole bunch of tractor beams. It's got a paralyzer. It can slow things down. So they have different capabilities is the point here. Now they will typically start at Mark III and then be upgraded by any text you get. So the way that I see the cruisers right now is you're probably going to want to focus in on when you find them. Okay, is that a tech I want to invest in? Am I going to want to get that? There's a little bit more of long-range planning there and what weapon techs you're going to invest in to look at the cruisers. And then also, notice that it says they're limited to one per fleet. They don't count as a standard ship line, but they are eligible for the FRS bonus. In other words, if you get an FRS ship, you'll notice in those tooltips it says you know, have so many non-elite ship lines. These are the elite ship lines that they're talking about, the cruisers. And then you will get the bonus, whatever they grant, whether it's hull or speed or whatever that thing is, to not just the other ship lines and the flagship, but then also the cruiser will benefit from that as well. So there's a definite synergy between the cruisers and the FRS ships. So these are a pretty quick hack. Let's go ahead and get one of these done. And as are most of these turrets and ship hacks and all of that, you're going to pay twice the cost if it's an enemy system as if it is yours. We'll simply take the taser in this case it's a slightly higher mark for the existing text in this game. And let's go ahead and get this rolling. And these take a little bit of time to build. They are not cheap. Let's just wipe out the defenses here. Triple my support fleet, so be it. Okay, now let's see if we're going to have this built in a moment here. Yep, you see it's building it. Okay. And then if we look over here at our side, these, this symbol here, this is the cruiser symbol. And if we take a look down here, this is what a taser riot control cruiser looks like. Now here's another one from a different map with a couple of different options for us to just look at their capabilities. Swarm and Trailblazer here, and we've got one that's from the Disruptive Tech and one from the Ambush. So they're not by any means all riot control. Every single weapons tech has a cruiser available to it. And so this Trailblazer has, you know, the infinite range guns, but mainly it is effective by launching the mines that are described here. And then we've got the Swarm Cruiser which has this inhibiting petard weapon. You can see the DPS, that's pretty nice. This is very similar, you know, to pike type weapons if you've done pike corvettes or if you've done pike turrets, same general type of weapon. But it also has the inhibiting part. It has the jammer part to increase the target's reload time along with the bonuses to high armor targets or targets at high health. And then you can see down here it also has mosquito drones, and they're particularly good at swarming large units. So there's all of these different sort of unique abilities that go along with the cruisers and a number of them to explore. Obviously, for time purposes, I'm not going to look at them all in this particular video. Turning our attention now to the AI's nasty picks, that is their special defensive structures, we're going to begin with the worst of them. This is... A uh, cute little purplish lavender, you know, building. It reflects the light. It's so nice. It's so wonderful and joyous to behold. Well, what it does is not wonderful and joyous to behold. And let's, just to put this in perspective, in testing, they have had situations where a 500 strength blob of nanocost came up against this thing. And the attractive Matrix Fortress soloed that blob of nanocost and was the only thing left standing by itself with no help. Why is that? Well, I mean, its weapon doesn't look that terrible, but it's got that reflex rail cannon. So it'll shoot back and anything that hits it. It's got an attracted field. You can see any shots fired nearby are gonna hit this, which means if there's any other ships surrounding it, defending it, well, I mean, you can't hit them. It's all gonna go to this. And then the more damage this does, the more it heals itself with the vampirism. Anything that fires from a long distance away, you can see at the bottom it's got the defensive bonus, does half as much damage. So the long and the short of all this is attacking this with a swarm of strike craft 
is virtually futile. Like, l literally, the strike craft are not going to get anywhere against it. You need larger ships, or you need turrets, preferably both. But if you have a strike craft heavy approach, strike craft heavy fleet, I mean, you might as well throw rocks at it for all the good it's going to do you. You're going to be in for a world of pain. Now, the others aren't as bad, but they can still be of significance. This is, there's a Vengeful Sniper Array in this particular system. Let's figure out where that is. Right down here. Looks pretty cool. And this is, again, not as bad if it's a tight battle or if you're early on in the game, it could hurt you. But it basically paralyzes a bunch of your strike craft. It's a nice structure for the AI to have. It's worse than a turret, worse than a guard post. But it's not going to cause a huge amount of damage. And you can see the paralyzing effect there with the reflex shot cannon that it has as well. So another weapon that will fire at you if you hit it. And then we have the chain lightning eye. The third type of eye, the plasma eye and the ion eye were already in the game. And this is the chain lightning eye which does what you might expect. It does everything an eye does. If you outnumber them too much in this system, it's going to get ticked off at you. But in this particular case, it's going to fire a chain lightning weapon at you instead. I'm going to wrap up today's episode. We're going to take a look at this. This is a big mess, is what this is. This is the Nomad Galaxy setting that is available for new games with the expansion. And... All of these are Nomad Planets, but not the same Nomad Planets that you get if you activate the Nomad Planet faction. You can't hack these, you can't crash them into other worlds, but they have the Nomad moving around the galaxy behavior. See, there's a couple here that don't have it, that's because those happen to be set to Architraves in this save. But generally speaking, they will all just move and move and move and keep moving. And that means, basically, this is just maximum chaos. This is not intended to be a balanced setting at all. It's very unbalanced. It's very chaotic. It's just one of those, look, if you want complete nonsense, turn on the Nomad Galaxy type of situation. And it will definitely create problems for you if, let's say you want to capture, for example, a Zenith Power Generator or a, you know, major data center. Well, you're going to have a really hard time defending it because you never know where the wormholes are going to be from one spot to the next. Now, an interesting thing happened here. I started here, and then I moved into these two systems. But take a look at what happened after a while. They moved apart, and we resulted in this. Now, this didn't last for a long time, thankfully, but my home world is cut off from my other planets. And if you look down here, I haven't actually, I can't even go through these, I haven't explored them yet. I would have to conquer more systems with my forces on one side of this sort of chasm or another, or wait for it to close up again, which will happen eventually. But because I couldn't even be able to get like my fleets over here back to my homeworld or my fleets that are on my homeworld over this way. And this is one example of many of the various craziness that can happen with the Nomad Galaxy. So, going on from here, still got one more video to do on looking at all of the Zenith Onslaught features. We're going to take a look at a lot of the smaller miscellaneous items that are available and just sort of wrap it up, hopefully. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you then.